So I was out shopping today, and then I brought my mask home, and I sprayed it with antiseptic stuff. Yeah. And I threw it back on, and then I think I've learned what huffing is all about. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, it was uh, something, but I took it off right away. I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Like some people might. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> no, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad my brain's with me at the moment. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Kids, gonna... <laughs> don't try this at home. <laughs> Let's see. First, the recording wasn't working, and then you forgot to see. So, I, you know, I don't know if that, that stuff affected you or not. Oh, Jerry's oh still I don't. Nobody knows what's wrong. <laughs> Nobody knows. No. So we're still quarantined. We're day two. We're not even counting anymore, I don't think. You know what, and it's coming back again. Did you hear the announcement yeah, today? Yeah, I heard they're closing more stuff today. You know, the thing is, people, you know, if we just do it like New York. New York, no deaths yesterday. Really? Yeah, yeah none. Well, none related to COVID. Well, uh, that right. was the first time since, you know, since the whole pandemic. But, you know, just to see what they've done. And then just to see we were doing so good. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to go out and the sun came out and Everybody partied. Yeah. Party with their friends. So, uh, you know, three, four weeks, let's do it and just get it over with. So, welcome to Rock and Roll Confessional. This episode, we are joined by the one and only frontman for the band, yes, John Anderson. John has released a new album called 1000 Hands. That's so amazing. I love it. How many times have you heard it, Rita? Uh, I've usually listened to like one or two songs an hour at a time. It's my meditation stuff. It is. Yeah, no, it I is. love it. No, I, I know you haven't put it down in yeah. for, I think, a month, at least a month we've had it. Absolutely. Yeah. John uh, talks about the album uh, that he gave us a month ago, plus he gives us the lowdown on the 50-plus artists that joined him on this album that he began recording 30 years ago. Whoa. We also hear about John going to his first Beatles show with his brother and meeting at separate times, Ringo and Paul, and also about his writing his music, and then we discussed... The fourth dimension with the fairies. <laughs> yep, we go there. We're going to go somewhere. That's where we're going to go. <laughs> As uh, you'll hear at the beginning of the interview, John starts off telling us about how he's been living with a broken foot since the pandemic began. So now open up your hearts and your minds and join us for the spiritual journey with John Anderson. have one person who died in this whole area, the San Luis Obispo area. So we're kind of cool, but we, I haven't been out for three months except to go and get my x-ray. Oh, wow. Because I, I broke my foot three months ago. Oh. The day, the day we were told to stay indoors. So. <laughs> well, that's I mean, a lesson. That's, Life telling you, you got to stay inside. Yeah, I guess you got to listen. It worked out great. Yeah. Except my wife, bless her, she had to... Uh, Learn to cook and wash up and carry things because I couldn't carry anything because I had a big boot on. I've still got it on, actually. Yeah. And uh, God bless her. You know, she had to make fires because it was cold. Uh, three months ago, it was cold. She had to go out and get the wood and make fires and clean up. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> two, two, two months of that, and she was so happy when I could wash up. <laughs> and when I could cook. John, why is it that your wife has to go gather wood to make a fire? Well, it's it's in the woodshed here. You know, we live in the country. Okay. And you don't have so an has- you don't have an oven or a stove? No, we have a fire. We have a fireplace. Oh, for the fireplace. Yeah. Got it. Oh, sorry. I thought it was for the cooking. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's a good idea. (laughs) I don't think she wants to bring in any more. Uh, No, no, no. Any more wood for cooking now. No, 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 no. no. Uh, She was brilliant. She, you know, she, she picked it up, the cooking thing, and I'd be sort of sitting on the couch with my foot on something so I could rest my foot, and I'd be shouting out, okay, now put the beans on now. And then afterwards, put the toast on, and then it should balance out. It should be okay. She was quite amazing. Well, that was very kind of her to help you during this your hard time. She's always been my very princess, in a sense, because uh, we're so connected to uh, to the nature of things. And she's a bird lady. She loves birds, and they love her. But now she's a goddess. 
It seems like she's always been a goddess. Uh, I've seen some videos where you guys are still very much in love, and it's it's really yeah. I think it was a fan that might have edited all these videos together of her on stage with you and coming out and yeah. playing, and yeah. it was really beautiful to see those. Yeah. Yeah, we got into trouble when we were dancing on stage. It was kind of funny. <laughs> Rick Wegman, you know, he, why are you dancing when I'm playing? Because <laughs> we're having fun, Rick. <laughs> there you go. That's beautiful. Uh, Want to thank you so much for uh, taking your time to do this. Uh, my name is Rita. Hi, Rita. And I'm CW. CW. We, okay. we we met many years ago during some rock line shows that I used to be at, and. I think uh, there. I, I think the band came to Kayla. You guys Several came, times, came yeah, to yeah. Kayla yeah. a few times. Yeah, CW. I found some chocolate in my pocket. <laughs> well, thank you. Please go ahead and eat it. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll save it. I'll save it for later. Ooh. We're recording, right? Yes, of okay, course we are. Okay, good, good, good. John Anderson, I I cannot thank you enough for this album. Uh, this is the the perfect album for the pandemic. I mean, it has given me such joy such hope and optimism thank you so much i love you. this record thank you thank you so much didn't think about that but hey because i started making it in big bear up in big bear mm -hmm. oh yeah 30 years ago that's how long it takes to make this record <laughs> music is timeless anyway so yes it is i mean there's just so much in this record i'm just I'm honestly very touched by it. And I know that whenever I listen to it first thing in the morning, it's like makes my day better. Oh, good. So good, good, thank good. you so much. Thank you. To me, it's kind of a, a spiritual album. It reminded me of like a Buddhist meditation because at the beginning and the end, I hear this little chime that I've, yeah. he I've heard during uh, meditations. And then from that chime at the beginning, we go into this all these different songs, but they're all very uplifting and upbeat and in yeah. incredibly enlightening, like Rita said, especially for the times now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting for me because two thirds of the songs were written 30 years ago, and I was still in the same mindset that I am now, which is fantastic. It happens that three years earlier, I'd met this little lady from Honolulu near the airport. Uh, she was staying with some people there from Hawaii. I was told I should meet this lady. And I kept saying, well, I'm making a record. I haven't got time <laughs> to meet another guru. I've met two or three of them. They're very nice, but you know, I'm, I'm busy. No, you've got to meet her. She's special. So this lady that asked me to go is named Linda Livingston. And she actually years later introduced me to my wife. Which wow. Is amazing. So I kept saying, no, I, I can't really. And then she said, she's here tomorrow. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Linda said, oh, and I'll take you to Disneyland afterwards. I said, cool, okay, we got a deal. <laughs> so I went to this house near the airport, walked in, and there was this little beautiful old lady called uh, Divine Mother Flora. She was there surrounded by flowers and everything, sitting on the couch, little white robes and everything. She reminded my mother, actually. So I sat in front of her and she said, oh, yeah, mm, mm. she didn't know how I was, you know. And she said to me, so you're very ripe. Have you been trying to meditate? I said, yeah, I've been trying for 15 years. I can't, <laughs> can't get there, you know. I can't get to that place of homeness, whatever it is. And she looked at me and said, Okay, let's try. So we went into meditation. Of course, I went straight to this beautiful place of energy, like a beautiful, <laughs> I can't explain it. And uh, after 15, 20 minutes, I came back to where I was and I looked at her and said, that was wonderful. What the heck was that? <laughs> and she said, that's meditation. So now you've got to practice to get back there. So I thought, okay, I'll try my best. And she said, you know, here's, here's uh, some words that you can say. And I said, thank you. Then I went to France and um, I felt really confused because it's very hard to remember the, 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 the words. So I wrote a song about it with the words. I remembered I was on tour with Yes and I, I was, this is about three months later. And I started to really get that sort of same beautiful energy of meditation of nothingness to say what it is with a beautiful indigo light energy. So uh, 
So I was in Chicago and I just finished the gig and, you know, you're on tour, you kind of, everything's hyped, hyped up, you know. I thought, I can't meditate this week at all. I'm not tired. I mean, I haven't, I haven't found that place of calmness, you know. So I had a phone number, Divine Mother Flora, and I called her up and said, uh, Oh, John, how are you? I said, I'm fine, but I'm having trouble meditating. She said, Oh, don't worry. I'll be there in a minute. Put the phone down. So I, so I put the, I put the <laughs> phone down and I went back into meditation mode and ding, there she mm. was. Wow. wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. When it came to doing uh, first songs for what became 1,000 Hands, I was in a really good place, emotionally and, and, and spiritually learning much more and feeling very uh, very free up in Big Bear. So when I wrote songs like Come Up, it was uh, the answer to the Proposition 3542. Because at that time, whenever I drove anywhere, there were these placards in everybody's garden, Proposition 33, oh, you know. Oh, okay. Vote, vote, yes, you know, kind of no. That kind of thing was happening. So I just molded that song into the idea of the Proposition 3542, everything begins and ends with you. Yeah. You know, it's like it all came together very, very quick. So. Yeah, I was That's wondering if that was based on numerology or if it was based on something like from human design no. or something yeah. like that. No, it was just in passing that I kept seeing <laughs> these black art. I love it. But that's how, you know, songwriting can be part of uh, what's going around and what's emotionally going around at the time. From my earliest days with Yes, you know, I'd, I, I would write things that I didn't know what I was saying. I was writing a season which could call you from the depths of your disgrace and rearrange your liver to the solid mental grace and achieve it all with music that can quickly from afar then taste the fruit of man recorded losing all against the hour. So what's that mean, John? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, it, it was only years later I discovered it was, it was sort of um, higher mm. consciousness speaking because I, I, I'd sing it when I was doing the song. I remembered, I thought I, I wanted to have a very mantra sort of intro. This is like 74, I think. Yeah. And so I'm singing with a guitar and da 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 how you write the lyrics, and then if someone were to ask you, what does it mean? You're like, I'm not sure yet. No, yeah. <laughs> Check back in 20 or 30 years, and I'll explain yeah. it. Yeah, a season which can call you from the depths of your disgrace. Very, very simple idea that your higher self will tell you when you're going through hard times and bring you out of the hard times into a light. Soon or soon the light, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway. You seem to uh, really exist on a different vibration than the average person. No, I mean, it, uh, no. I, I'm saying that with all sincerity. Uh, <laughs> you, you really have, you really tuned into, tuned into whatever that is. Here's the key. We all have the same connection with the divine. And that's what I learned over the years, that we're all connected to the, defi the divine. And it's how you aspire to enjoy the day or aspire to enjoy the company you keep or aspire to enjoy the weather and the birds and the bees and everything like that and the trees. I was singing about the trees yesterday. I used to climb trees when I was about five or six years old, like we all do, don't we, CW? Uh, absolutely. Climb trees. Me too. When we don't have you a broken know, leg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you climb up and you climb up and then you climb up to the view and the view is gorgeous and you you sit there for a long time just looking at the view and then you climb back down or fall whichever way <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is as i've got older i've enjoyed life more and more and more obviously i have my terrible times and go crazy at times and and shout and go crazy if if <laughs> if, if the sound guy gets it wrong in a show you know because the, the audience deserve perfection well, anyway. it seems like you're very much in the moment also. You're always, yeah. you're, you, you've learned to become very present. Yeah, li living in the now, because uh, there was a book in the 60s. It was called Now, and every hippie 
carried one round and I had one and, and it was all about being in the now and the moment. My son, years ago, he, he actually got me a birthday present out of the blue. He said, Dad, I've got your birthday present. And it was a watch. And I looked at it and it just said, now. <laughs> wow. I love that. It didn't say <laughs> that is no, great. And no hands no on it? No, no hands or anything. You said, now. Now. It's just beautiful. Beautiful. There's something about you that you seem to be blessed with the wisdom of uh, several lifetimes. And I mean that in the most <laughs> well, I mean that in the most sincere positive way. I mean on the air uh, many times and I, I mean this with all reverence, I've called you the cosmic choir boy. You know, it's just like your your yeah. music is kind of like in touch with that thing that everybody I think strives to get to, but you incorporate all that stuff from past lifetimes too, it seems. I believe I believe you're correct. And and uh I've had some very interesting events happen in my life to tell me where I've been before. I was lucky to go to China in uh, nineteen eighty nine. I decided to go to Hong Kong. I went to see my spiritual teacher, Divine Mother Flora in Hawaii. And then I went on to Hong Kong and went to Guilin, which is southern China. And in those days, it wasn't westernized very much in, in China. It was amazing. I remember getting off the plane in Guilin, and but it's very famous for these lakes and very tall, thin mountains in the lakes that have got little houses on. It's the most beautiful, incredible place. I remember getting off the plane. We flew from uh, it was just me and and our people and uh, and people on the everybody on the plane was smoking. Oh. It was amazing. <laughs> so. I got out on the plane, everybody smoked all the way to Guilin from Hong Kong and uh, got off the plane. I, I was looking for fresh air. I got out there. <laughs> it was a very small airport with a big red Chinese sign like that. And underneath there was a big white banner and it said, peace, love, tourism. Mm. And I said, oh my God, this is beautiful. And I kept thinking I've been here before. Well, it was probably about... Six months later, I was in New York, and I, I went to, to have my hands read, you know, like, what do they call them? Uh, palm, palm reading. Palm, palm reader. And she said, uh, oh, you, uh, you were obviously in China on, in, in the last century, and your mother, she was a medicine woman, and you rode on your bike everywhere delivering medicine to villages. And I said, I knew I'd been on bikes before, sort of thing. You know, that was kind of the vibe. Maybe we weren't bikes or, or whatever. Could have been a donkey. <laughs> With fast But that's what I did then, you know? Yeah. It's funny that uh, I had a most extraordinary event happen in Vegas, of all places. You know, Vegas is, is not exactly what it seems to be. It's a very powerful place on highly evolved spiritual level. Have you, have you ever seen those movies by Wim Wender? I've seen a few, yeah. Uh -uh. It's a piece of, you know, you two did far some away, stuff so with him. Far away, so far away, so close. Yeah. That's one of them. The angels are around all the time, but we don't we don't notice them because right. they're, they're angels, sort of thing. And I met one in Vegas, of all things. Huh. I'd just seen, uh, with the band, we did a show and everything. We went to see Frank Sinatra in the Caesar's Palace, and it was amazing. Frank Sinatra was unbelievably good. Hmm. The magic of him on, on stage, just by himself, we had an orchestra at the back there, but just him on stage and the way he moved and... He'd do that when he wanted a big note. He'd just move his arm and kick. Go, New York, New York, you know, whatever. <laughs> and he sang Sending the Clowns. Mm. And he looked like a Mandarin to me. Mm. He looked like an ancient Mandarin. Mm. So after that event, I wanted to see him. I really wanted to meet him. So idiot that I am, you know. Everybody else in the band, they all went to a big party. We're going to a party, you know, it's da -da 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 Vegas. I said, no, I'm, I'm okay. So I just wandered around the stage door. And I found out later, he would never use the stage door. He had a, he had his own little, uh, tunnel to get, <laughs> yeah, to get from his dressing room to uh, his bedroom. So I, I sat there looking at people gambling and things. And, uh, this little girl actually came up and tapped me on the shoulder from behind. It's about midnight, you know? And she said, she looked, I turned around and I said, hello. She said, John, are you ready? And I said, what? She said, are you ready? And I knew she was an angel. I knew mm. it. And I said, yep, I'm ready. Thank you. And she ran off and her parents were at this 
the door going through the door and I waved and okay. I turned around and I'm sitting there's a guy sitting next to me, like a sort of Jamaican looking guy, you know. He said, Hi John, are you ready? Wow. I said, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I need to get a drink. <laughs> so let's go to the bar. Anyway, he said he could, you know, win me a million dollars or if I wanted to meet God. And I said, Okay, well, I, I'd like to meet God. <laughs> It sounded so crazy at the time. But anyway, this wonderful event happened. I went back with him to my room. Everything disappeared. We, we, he was chanting and he, this couple of wonderful energy beings came and spoke to me about what I do. I sing about soon or soon the light. I was on the tour of uh, Gates of Delirium, the Relayer tour. And they were saying, and now you know what the light is. So you will be singing about the light in the 21st century. This is like 1975, 76, somewhere around that time. So I said, okay. And, uh, th- you know, I was on man's and knees in, in a, in a trembling piece of jelly because I was with higher angels. And it was an extraordinary event, of course. And then as, as I, I, I'm lying on the bed at the end and the guy who brought me in there, and I'd asked for his name, but he, he can never hear an angel's name. I was to learn later. And uh, he'll say something, but you don't know what it is because the angels have got very cosmic here. And uh, as he was closing the door, he said, oh, by the way, you know William Blake, don't you? And I said, yeah, actually, yeah. He said, well, learn more about him, okay? I said, bye. Anyway, that's my story. And uh, about a month later, Alan White was doing a solo album. And he asked me to go and sing the song on his album. And it was a William Blake song. Mm. The... the um, Song of Innocence. So I did that. And over the years, I kind of thought about it and thought, you know, William Blake, and I, I looked at his work, and I, I had a book of, of his work anyway, his artwork and everything, and his poems. And one of the strongest uh, poems that he wrote was, uh, it's a sort of national anthem in England. It's called, uh, well, the words are, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains. It's a beautiful uh, lyric, and... Every time they have the proms at the Albert Hall, you have five, six thousand people singing that with the full orchestra and the choir. It's kind of magical. I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I started thinking about what I was working on. I've been working on this piece of music now for three months. It's just music that I wrote in the space of a week. I just spontaneous four pieces of music about hopefulness, joyfulness, gratefulness, thankfulness. And after I'd done the music, I just said, oh, that's, it's, it's a lot of fun, that music, and, cause it's all in sections, you know. So I thought, I'll just put it out there on the internet. And my good friend, Mike Byrne, is a marvelous video guy. He created videos for them so you can actually see mm-hmm. and feel the music. And it's all to do with, uh, to me, when I did the music, I thought it was like, I really, what I should do is write songs and lyrics within the music now. So it's like a template, like a blueprint. And I just finished the first round of the four pieces, yeah, last week. Wow. And it was, such a, it was an incredible feeling to, to sort of get to that place. And, and now all, all I'm going to do is uh, hopefully, you know, find a way to record with the local symphony and the choirs. Because they have great choirs here in San Luis Obispo. Thank you for answering the question, yeah. where does music come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is one of the songs from the new album, A Thousand Hands. Yeah. Well, that happens very, very simply because when I started working two years ago with Michael Franklin, the producer guy, who called me up and said, where are those tapes? And I said, what tapes? He said, oh, the tapes you did on in Big Bear. And I said, I think they're in the garage. I haven't seen, I haven't looked at them for 15 years or so. He said, go and check. And so I went and checked. Oh, they're there. And so I sent the 24 tracks, big boxes, to him. And he put them in his studio. And you can only play them once after. You have to bake them. You have to put them in an oven. And you bake them. And you can only play them once or it'll just fall apart because they've been sitting there for years, you know. And it's straight into the computer. And they sounded lovely. (laughs) And Michael said, uh, so what were your ideas on doing this album? And I said, well, originally it was going to be called Uzlot, U-Z-L-O-T. Which in the north of England, you say, come on, Uzlot, let's go and play soccer, you know, fo- football, not soccer. Come on, Uzlot, let's go and play cricket. 
<laughs> that means a lot of us, right? It's very simple. So I said, yeah. Originally, I started writing with a friend of mine. His name's uh, Brian Chatton. He was in my first band, The Warriors, in mm. the 60s. He was a young kid, 16 years old. He could play uh, Green Onions. So we let him in the band. <laughs> anybody who can play Green yeah. Onions, you're in the band. <laughs> we became great friends, you know, and uh, had so many adventures together over the years. And I just knew that uh, there was something about Brian. So I, I said, you know, just do some ideas for pian- on piano, some song music ideas. And I'll write some songs and lyrics. And that's what we did. So basically, we never got them finished. We just had them, to a certain degree, pretty well organized. There was about eight tracks. And uh, Chris Squire and Alan White were in L.A. at the time. So I went down with one of the tapes and, I, and asked them to play on the tracks, you know. And I gave them a $1,000 each. <laughs> Paid so they for were the happy. time. <laughs> and I was happy. So Michael Franklin said, you know, we've listened, I've listened to all the music. Some really interesting stuff here. So who would you like to play on the record? I said, well, in, originally I wanted the Beach Boys to sing on the record because I met Brian Johnson. Well, I, I was at NAM, you know, in NAM yeah. there's a music event. You know, oh, yeah. I was working with this guy who had this strange keyboard system and I, I was up there with a the guitar and we were singing, help me Rhonda, help, help me Rhonda, help me Rhonda, help me, you know, come on, sing along. And, 10 people in front of you, you know, and there was Brian Johnson. <laughs> Where is Brian Johnson at the Beach Boys? So we became friends. And then, I, so I went up to talk to him and the other guys about singing on this project. I, I was very into Wayne Shorter, one of the great musicians, and uh, Billy Cobham, who played with Mavishnu Orchestra, who I'm, God, unbelievable drummer. And uh, so I mentioned this to Michael. He said, well, Billy Billy Cobham, I, I've got his phone number. So I'll, I'll find out if he can come over and play on one of the tracks. And I said, wonderful. And he got a phone number of Ian Anderson, uh, Tower of Power he knew. Oh, yeah. And, and Chick Corea played on this track that Billy Cobham played on. I'd actually done some work with uh, Jean Ponty, my brother, my Brittany brother. Mm-hmm. And he got him to play on the track Come Up, it's called. And uh, oh, yeah. when I first I first heard the track Come Up, it sounded really okay, it was going to be good. And then he put Billy Cobham on it, and I said, oh, wow. Could, could you turn the drums up, please, Michael? Yeah, because on the phone I was listening to it. I was listening to it here in my studio. Turn the drums up more. I want to hear Billy Cobham. So he did. And then we added Chick Corea, and then Jean Ponty. It was like magic. It, it's like... Uh, I suppose making a cake and putting all the beautiful icing all over it and making sure it had cherry on top. So <laughs> making sure, because you couldn't believe how good it sounded. And you think, wow, this is pretty cool. And Michael said to me, so what have you been doing lately? Oh, I said, every morning I get up, I, I, I go in my studio and I do, I call it vocalizationing. And what it is basically is, it's, it's something I, I, I kind of started doing years and years ago. I did a track called We Have Heaven on an album called Fragile. Mm-hmm. There, were, there was some space in the studio downstairs, uh, Chris and Bill working out some routines. And I went downstairs into this empty studio. Uh, ELP were working there, but they had the day off. So I just did this vocalizing thing called We Have Heaven. Tell the moon to tell the moon to tell the moon and just keep reading, adding vocals all the way. And I've done it over the years, but then Michael said to me, so have you got anything? I said, yeah, I've got these couple of uh, vocalization in things. And he said, well, what are they called? I said, well, one's called Ramalama and the other one's called Where Does Music Come From? So I sent him just the vocals and he is a fantastic musician. He actually did most of the sounds for Where Does Music Come From on his flight to China on his computer. Wow. So you can imagine where we've come from, from me going downstairs in the basement of the studio to We Have Heaven, and that took, you know, quite a while, four or five hours. But the fact that he could just do that like that and send it, he was in China, and he sent it to me and says, look what I've done with uh, your vocalizationing. I said, wow, that's amazing. And he did it to Ramalama as well. So 
Both incredible songs. Yeah, I both love of, Rama Lama. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Another very uh, spiritual song. And, and maybe you can just kind of quickly tell us about Rama Lama, because it's one of the Indian, I don't know if gods is the right term, is it? Do you know, I've got no idea. But oh, I believe, wow. no, I believe it is uh, relating to an enlightened something. I've, I've had a couple of different. One of the Hindu deities, I believe. There you go. Good. Okay. Hey, well, you know, you know more than me. <laughs> That's right, because you won't know for another 30 years what your songs are about. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just make it up for you, John. <laughs> yeah. I was just doing a video for, for that song. My wife was doing the camera. We were just doing it on the green screen. Here. And it was just fun to do because uh, on stage with the band, you know, I, I did some touring last year, 1,000 Hands Band, to do tracks from, from the album, thinking the album was coming out at that time, but it never really materialized properly the record deal so we just toured and we were doing these songs and the audiences loved them it felt really interesting oh is ready for the answer complete high above the very simply a. I, I get into writing words that don't mean anything because <laughs> just sound cool you know <laughs> so that's what happened with those couple of songs now for a quick break this just in what do you think? I love Rachel? John Anderson. I, I I could just sit down and talk with him for hours and hours. I know, and we did. We had yeah. to, we had to edit this a little bit short, but uh, we did for quite a while. And he is a very interesting, spiritual, loving being. Yeah. Yes, and very present. Yeah. God, yeah. I wish I could be like that. <laughs> You got some of it down. <laughs> I got some of it. I'm you only know? present when I'm sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's uh, break time. We've got more with John Anderson, but Patreon supporters, we want to thank you from the top to the bottom of our hearts. You are the ones that believe in us so much that you are willing to make a small pledge each month to keep this show rolling. We couldn't do it without you. And one of the perks, as you'll hear in the second half of our show, is that we offer the opportunity for our Patreon supporters to submit questions to some of our guests. If you have it in your heart and love rock and roll stories like we do, please go to the support tab on our website at rockandrollconfessional.rocks, R-O-C-K-S, or directly to Patreon to make a small pledge. Every dollar counts, and we appreciate every dollar, trust me. In our second half, we have more powerful and personal conversation with John Anderson. He talks about the different sounds and instruments that are used on this new album, 1,000 Hands. And we also go back to 1962, and John talks about starting his first band with his brother, and we get into more mystical enlightenment. Yes, now get ready for the second half of our interview with John Anderson. Something else I really love about the album is that it really incorporates instruments and sounds from all over the world. I mean, I, I hear a didgeridoo, I yeah. hear, uh, well, the banjo. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously things that you would, but there's also some voices in there that I understand are, are from Africa or something. Actually, it's interesting because when I was in Big Bear, I went down to L.A. to my friend Linda Livingston said, suggested that I meet uh, Kitaro. Huh. Kitaro was doing a show in the, the theater in Beverly Hills there. The opening act with these six women from Belgium, they were called Zap Mama. And I had no idea. Somebody on the microphone said, now, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna, your life will change. Here is that mama. And these women came on and sort of moved and danced and chanted and sang like you would not believe. It was like a miracle to me. And uh, Michael got them to sing on this album. And they're all over the place. Mm. So there's very ethnic energy. You know, they're, 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 a couple of them are from North Africa. So you've got this, vocalization energy then ethnic energy here and there and cosmic energy and it's it's all in a big bucket <laughs> absolutely love it i mean you talked earlier about meditation and when i first heard the album it was during the pandemic it was probably maybe a month ago the three weeks ago that we got the advance of the album which is going to be out end of july but i just listened to it and i went into you know one of those states of relaxation Mm -hmm. uh, that you talk about. And it reminded me so much that I need to slow down sometimes and just yeah. get back to what 
I love, and that's listening to music, being inspired by music. And this album, again, just moved me. So, I, you know, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, it's just delightful. But I love everything about it. The other list of musicians that you have on there, you mentioned oh my God. Uh, God, like Chris Squire, <laughs> Ellen White, Steve Howe. Does Steve Howe do most of that uh, acoustic guitar that's on the album? No, I, I haven't worked with Steve for 20 years or so. Um, I've tried many times to connect and, you know, just not the right time, you know. Originally, Now was a three-minute song. And I kept saying, well, it's, it's a nice song, but it's just too much all in one go. Why don't we just have the first verse and so there in the middle of the album, another verse with some orchestra bits, and, and at the end, we'll, we'll finish with Now and Again and, and, and add some space energy at the end of the, the song part, you know. And Michael did one, and I just said to him, look, I actually sang on a, a Steve Howe album when he did songs of Bob Dylan. I sang uh, Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, mm. which I loved. And I think Steve owes me one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, I emailed Steve. Hi, Steve. I, I've been in touch once or twice a year over the years. And I said, hi, Steve, I'm just doing this album, this track. It just needs your guitar. And then we're finished the, the album. So could you just, you know, do stuff? And he said, no problem. So I sent him the tape and everything. And it came back. And I right away, I wanted to sing because it's Steve, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I sang, I sang about that we used to be together very close and we used to sing together. His, he would sing with his guitar and I was singing with my voice. And it was a great wonderful feeling of uh, connection and full circle, the circle, the cycle of life. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. You know, it was really good. I, I just wanted to list for our listeners some of the other, just a few. There's like 50 musicians you've brought in for this, but we've also got Steve Morse, uh, Rick Derringer, Pat Travers, Alan White, Tower of Power, Chris Squire, Tower of Power, yeah. Carmine uh. of Peace, Chick Corea, Jonathan Kane, Bobby Kimball from Toto, and there's about another 35, 40 artists that you brought into this whole thing. Yes, no, it wasn't my fault. It was Michael. <laughs> I said, us lot means a lot of us, you know. <laughs> and, and he turned around after his trip to, to China and he said, well, why don't we call it 1,000 Hands? And I thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Because I've been writing... Uh, you know, I've been working on uh, ideas of... It's, it's good if you actually write down all the people you, that inspire you throughout your life. Sure. And I, I, I did it one time, and I, I finished up with about 80, 100 people who, who like Nina Simone and Stevie Wonder and mm. Beatles. You know, I went to see the Beatles movie yesterday. Which one? I don't know what it was, but I, I sobbed all the way through. Ah. Uh. I actually did. As soon as the guy started doing yesterday mm. on the guitar, yeah, and the arrangements are beautiful. That movie is so beautiful, but it was something to do with without the Beatles, I wouldn't be where I am now, you know. So I just sobbed all the way through. Mm. I, I was with my wife Jane and my daughter and her husband, my daughter Jade and Kit, her husband. They kept leaning over and saying, "Are you okay, George?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just sobbing." All the way through the, the movie. It was unbelievable. Wow. So you get a feeling of where you've come from mm -hmm. as an artist, as a musician, and, and what the, the roads that I've traveled musically over the years. And uh, I'm so grateful. Who were some of your other inspirations? I mean, you mentioned like Frank Sinatra and, and the Beatles. But when you were growing up, the, the young lad in uh, well, England there. <laughs> well, the story is very, very simple that uh, me and my older brother, Tony, we would sing Everly Brothers songs as we delivered milk around the town that I live. And we'd work on the local farm and milk the cows and deliver milk when I was, from when I was nine, ten years old. I did that. I left school at 14. So up until that time, all I knew was in the 50s was the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly and then... And then me and my brother went down south to our auntie for a two week stay. And he bought a Elvis Presley album and a, a little record player. And we listened to Elvis Presley all the time. Now my brother then had a band, uh, in 1962. He had a band called the Warriors. They had two singers. One of them 
a tall guy. He wanted to be a hairdresser, so he left the band. And my <laughs> brother said to me, would you, would you like to join the band? And I said, yeah, okay, we can do some Everly's. He said, yeah, we'll do some Everly Brothers. And he was going to be Elvis Presley because he liked to think he was Elvis Presley. This is like 1963. We heard this record on the radio, Love Me Do, mm. by the Beatles, who would say, hey, we should learn that one because they're from Liverpool. Tony said to me one day, let's go and see them, you know, because they were playing in Southport, which was like 20 miles north of Liverpool. They were playing in the Floral Hall. So me and Tony, on his motorbike, he had a motorbike like, uh, you remember the Wild One? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Marlon Brando? Mm-hmm. With a big, and a hat. He had, a, he had the same thing. He had the hat. <laughs> he was Marlon Brando then. So we went to see the Beatles and got in there and they just started up. So there was a crowd of people, mostly guys, you know, some, you could hear some girls at the front, uh, uh, no screaming. They were listening to the band and the band was so good because we, I'd started singing with the Warriors and we'd rehearsed a bit. And we came to see this and this was a really professional band. It was amazing. The, the girls would scream at the end of each song and whenever John talked or Paul talked, you know. Something like that. And it was a strangest experience. Like, I want to be a Beatle. Yeah. <laughs> like a thousand other <laughs> hundreds of thousands of guys. I want to be a Beatle. <laughs> that was it. So that's when we started doing the Warriors band touring. You know, t- touring. It wasn't touring. He was doing gigs. He finished up doing gigs in a working men's club, you know. And you go on after the comedian for three songs. And then after the stripper for three songs. And then after, <laughs> and then, and then after Bingo. <laughs> That's a full <pool> evening. <laughs> well, as a little kid, you must have enjoyed the stripper part. <laughs> Believe me, because to get on stage, you had to go through this alleyway to get to the stage, and the stripper would come off and go past you like that, and you go, that put me off sex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Held uh, off the puberty. <laughs> <laughs> crazy and wonderful and, and basically we followed the Beatle trail because there was a trail we read about. The Beatles started playing in clubs in Cologne and Munich and Hamburg so we went as a band and started doing that. By then the Beatles were, can you imagine what they were doing at the beginning? They were just, please please me, oh yeah and love me do and all these kind of happy love songs you know and all of a sudden Revolver. Yeah, and yeah. Then, Abbey Road and the White House. Sergeant Hub. Pepper, and yeah. By the time we got to Hamburg, 67, Sergeant Pepper. So my whole world was, what, what are they going to do next? How do they do this? I remember we were driving in Germany and we stopped for some petrol. You know, in those days, they had these called, called transistor radios about this big. And there was a transistor radio outside the office. And this music was coming from the transistor radio. It's like like a, a little sort of strings and not a big orchestra, it's like a small quartet orchestra. Du, 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 du. And you can hear it. Eleanor Rigby mm-hmm. picks up the rice in a church where a wedding has been. I remember lying down on the floor right next to the transistor radio going, what the hell is this? And it was the Beatles. So, you know. Did you ever become friends with them? I mean, after no, because I- late 60s you started, yes. No, oh, no. You know, I met I met Paul McCartney once, and I had no idea what to say. He was coming down. <laughs> he'd come to see that the yes, we were playing in a in a in London. It was called the Apollo, and now it's called the Apollo. And I was going up to the dressing room. He was coming down, and I went, oh, Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> he shook my hand. And he walked I think he said that was good, lad. <laughs> Some like that. And then I, I think I met. Um, I've met Ringo a couple of times, but I'd never know what to say to him or George Harrison. John and I never met. But to me, gods, mm. that's all there is to it. And uh, so the, the movie, you know, got me. Oh. Mm. I love that. <laughs> we would be remiss if uh, we didn't talk about Yes a little bit. Uh, last time I saw you play was uh, probably 2018 at the Greek Theater uh, with Rick Wakeman and the band and Trevor Raven. And it was just great it was just magical yeah. yeah no i was just wondering what what your plans are with the s are you con- going to continue with the s or just let it be? well next year is the 50th anniversary of uh fragile and the yes album so 
Okay, then I'll, I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I had a dream last week, which was kind of interesting dream that uh, I was in the room with all, all the guys from the Yes contingent and Rick and Trevor and a couple of other people from somewhere else. And, you know, and I was waiting to go on stage and do my solo with my guitar, just go on and sing with my guitar which I love doing, it, it changes the dynamic when you can just sing to an audience and you're accompanying yourself. Not very well, because I don't play guitar that well, but at least I, did, I, I made it work, you know. So I was thinking, who if that's the way to do it? You know, you, you know, the, the Yes Band could start off and then I'll go on and do some songs or I'll start the show, I don't care. I'm going to start and sing some songs, let them play and then me and Trevor and Rick could do and then they'll all get together at the end and we'll all do a Close to the Edge and Awaken. Because hmm. Awaken is like the true top of the mountain for Yes. Awaken was a, a very emotional event, musically speaking. But whenever we perform that song, something very, very tangible that's very, very unique, like a little bit, you know, close to the edge. You know, these were very unique pieces of music to the music genre. You know, they weren't things you can hear on the radio, but they were music. And that's how Yes survived, by being music first. And then it'll be challenging ourselves to create ideas that are a little bit different than the norm. That was what 70s was all about, you know, being adventurous. I'm still adventurous. It's my personal goal to make some great music. And people say, what do you mean you want to make great music? Well, I want to make great music. What do I want to do? I'm going to make mediocre music. <laughs> you know, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit around and make songs that don't really mean anything so much. I'm just going to make some money. No, I'm going to do some great music in my life. And I think I'm getting there slowly. It's a slow <laughs> process. But it's normal. You know, it's just normal. Well, you've had a, a long career with some great, great songs. Uh, we have a question from one of our uh, listeners, Kevin Thompson. Uh, his question is, when writing tales from topographic oceans and relayer, were you ever concerned that you were writing 20-minute songs and that you probably wouldn't get supported with radio airplay? Was it a concern to the record companies? It's a lovely story. When we were on tour with Fragile, there was um, eight-minute pieces of music on the record. He was a Notice Grace, Starship Trooper, Roundabout. And uh, as we were driving around Pennsylvania, we heard Roundabout. It came on the radio. First time we ever heard wow. it on the radio. And it came to the middle section. And it went straight to the uh, solo and the end. So I said, what happened? I called up Ahmet Ertigan and said, hi, Ahmet. What happened to the records? Is somebody cut it in half? He said, yeah, it's the only way we can get it on the radio. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> as long as people are hearing the song, that's great. So as we toured around America, we would play a lot of uh, universities and we'd go to the, the radio stations, the university people, and they would play Starship Trooper, which is seven and a half minutes, eight minutes long. Mm -hmm. You always know it's great, it's nine minutes and around about full, you know. And uh, it got me thinking, wait a minute, and it's called FM Radio. You know, you know, CW, you probably know. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've been there. Yeah, <laughs> spent oh, most of our lives there. Yeah, and uh, wow, they actually play long-form pieces of music. And I've been thinking about doing a longer piece of music, and uh, me and Steve were really tight at that time in terms of, like, musical brothers. We've got to create new songs. Da, 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 da. We've done quite a bit on Fragile, but I just sensed there was something about Steve had so much uh, industry with his guitar work and his chords and finding ideas quickly when I came up with ideas. So we got together and we wrote Close to the Edge because I remember I went to his house and he was, I was just doing this, John, listen, close to the edge, try by the corner. And I said, down at the end, <laughs> by the river. Because I was reading Sid Arthur. Hmm. The fin Sid Arthur finishes up by the river. And I, went, I said, change chord. Seasons will pass you by. There's a chord. I get up. <laughs> wow. That's how we work. You know, he's just doing it. So we started to sort of that afternoon, we just sort of put together the, the, the sort of shape of uh, Close to the Edge. And I kept thinking, well, the, the middle of Close to the Edge, you know, we should go into the ocean of energy rather than, because I was very into uh, electronic music and Carlos Castaneda uh, writings. Mm. 
about what energy surrounds us really and this kind of thing. There was a musician called uh, Walter Carlos. Now he's Wendy Carlos, but it, originally Walter Carlos had written a, uh, an album called Sonic Seasoning. And it was this beautiful, beautiful, surreal energy album of music and beautiful. So I said, the, the middle of the song, which is going to this wash of sound, you know, I thought, in the middle, we'll just have a very simple song. And Steve was playing these chords, and I started singing, uh, I get up, I get down, which would be, I was singing about two million people barely satisfy. 200 women watch one woman cry too late. The idea that, you know, those days we were hearing more and more about the malnutrition of children in Africa and the lack of food all over the world, et cetera, when we are abundant with food, et cetera, et cetera. Just like now, nothing's changed that much. And I was singing about that. So we actually put down that song, Idea, and a couple of days later, Steve said, do you know, I just realized those chords, I wrote a song. And I said, well, sing it to me. He went, drink in her white lace. You could clearly see the lady sad looking. And it fit perfectly with my song. And I said, that's it. That's the middle stanza. I, I learned the word stanza. Stanza. That's what you talk about when you're composing a symphony. <laughs> anyway. So where was I? That was the idea of creating long form music simply because the FM radio was happening in America yeah. and nobody knew about it but me and somebody else. But unfortunately, by the time we finished the, the album, FM had closed up in America because it wasn't making any money. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they went to AM within the space of two months, three months, and our album came out and... <laughs> It was like, okay, let's get on the road and we'll perform it. You know, we went out and performed that music. And that was, that was the joy of the 70s. We would go out and play 5,000 people because Roundabout actually brought a lot of people in. But we could go out there to all these people and play And You and I and, you know, and then uh, your dun, 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 Siberian Katru mm -hmm. uh, and perform this music knowing we had an audience that were willing to listen to longer form pieces of music. So the challenge was, will they listen to Close to the Edge? And the only way that it would work, in my mind, we had to really evolve the stage vibe, you know, and Mike Tate, God bless him, who was our roadie initially, then became the stage guy, and now as Tate Tower is one of the biggest production companies in the world. He said, I know, we'll do dry ice in the middle. We had this dry ice all over the stage and it would pour over the front and people would go, wow, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> so that's, that's what happens, you know. We figured it out by giving the audience more visualization, better lighting, because Michael Tate designed all the lighting styles mm. that are now used by everybody. Yeah, you, were, you guys were always up on that. Yeah, because we were playing to to a large amount of people, and all I would think about the people at the back are just seeing a little person singing away in white, and the little people on stage. Why don't we just give them more energy? Get the laser beams, quick! <laughs> you know, we were the first to use laser beams. Actually, we weren't the first because Vangelis used them mm. in Paris, and somebody sent me a photograph, and I found out what was happening. We got a laser company in England. It just started. And the laser beam had to be kept cool by a gigantic sort of bath of water. And that traveled all over the world with us. But we could go on stage and that perfect moment when you need something soon or soon to light, the laser beams would come out over the audience. And it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Hence uh. Uh, the event in uh, Vegas. Ah, yeah. Because laser is from the next dimension. You know, we live in eight different dimensions. We're in the third, going slowly into the fourth and fifth. That's why we're going through this uh, transition consciously. And what happens in the fourth? Does it get well, the better? Well, fairies, the fairies live there. Okay, you know, good. The, the light beings, as one might say. We used to be very connected to the fairy kingdom, one might say. That's why we think about it when we're children and we believe in it when we're kids. And we grow out of it because of the nonsensical understanding that, ah, there's no such thing as Father Christmas, part of the idea. 
And he's white. Why is he white? You know? <laughs> So God's not white, he's multicolored. We are all connected. We are all indigenous people. Yeah. We are actually. We're all from indigenous. Sure. Way, way back, you know. Sorry, yeah. I don't want to get carried away. No, <laughs> no, I, I could listen to you for hours going, you know. Sometimes it's seeing is believing. I mean, it's like I didn't believe in ghosts until I saw one and I had an experience with one. And then all of a sudden it's like, now I believe them and I've seen them many times. And yep. to some people, that sounds crazy. And to other people, they're like, oh, tell me more. So yeah. it's kind of that same type of thing that it's like, until yeah. you see it, you don't believe it. I know. Well, we're sort of heading slowly, slowly, slowly to an enlightening period of time. That's why the laser was given to us via the computer, because that's where laser is. You know, you understand that, right? No, explain. Well, laser, laser, and everything comes from under the ground. Okay. Energy. Everything. What you're sitting on, what you're holding in your hand, everything comes from under the ground. So it's earth projected into form and so on via intellect, conscious waking up to what we can do with iron, what we can do with steel, what we can do with speakers. Um, hello. <laughs> yeah. um, cell phones. You know, and we've done very well, you know, to a certain point that we've lost our way by neglecting this planet. And that's the, the delicate balance, the, the out of balance living that the Native Americans have been telling us for years. Mm -hmm. They live in balance with the earth. That's why we have a virus. Well, yeah, as I said, that this is part of the awakening of the consciousness of the planet. We are actually all one. It's the first time in history that we are connected, completely yeah. connected on one little planet, a little tiny planet. Mm. It's a leap of faith to know that where we're going is going to be good for us. And we have to share the world. I wrote a 10-point explanation of what I think, and I put it on my website, on my Facebook. Great. Well. It connected to a lot of people because the idea is that uh, once we start to understand that we are the earth, or we are one on the earth, that we are to become enlightened beings. Because we all deserve freedom of enlightenment rather than the dogma of a lot of things. And uh, the idea, very simply, is that it's slowly happening. And this virus is a pointer to understand that if we are reckless and go out like a lot of people are doing now in America because the orange man thinks it's cool <laughs> not to wear a mask. <laughs> and it's cool to say the most absurd, absurd things that come out of this, and he lies all the time. Oh, yeah. And it's been proved. You know, it's just a question of everybody waking up to that. But once we reestablish a little bit of normality and Obamaism yeah. in America, then we'll, then, you know, this whole thing with uh, you know, Black Lives Matter is so true. Yeah. It's so true. It's so unbelievably true. And... It's a conversation we need to have also about the Native Americans. Absolutely. Now, your daughter just recently did uh, a documentary, right, on Native yeah. Americans? God bless her. Yes, yes. I'm so happy and grateful for, for Deborah who did this documentary. It's what you watch it and you, you can't believe half of what, what you're hearing and what you're watching in this day and age. The Native Americans are still being treated yeah. with such disrespect and no love at all. Because obviously, you know, you always get people, well, they've got casinos. Yes, and they deserve all our money. God help us. Come on, think yeah. about it carefully. I've been to, like, yeah. many of the reservations, like, you know, yeah. in, in New Mexico and in Arizona. The Hopi, Hopi yeah. Nation is one of my favorite. But it's just the amount of poverty that is there. It's just like, it just makes, this is America. It's just like, how can this be? Why is this happening? Yeah. The best record of the last 10 years was This Is America. Yeah. Mm. And the best video, serious, seriously good. Yeah. And deserve all the accolades. But, you know, there's that energy waiting to say stuff and to, and to be stuff and to think stuff. And a lot of it comes through music and uh, blessings to everybody because we all deserve it, you know, yeah. especially the little children, little tykes. Yeah. I've got three grandchildren. Ah, uh, how old? Seven, five. Oh, three. Perfect and they're, age. They're joyful, you know. They're and like to everybody, everybody's got children. We are children. We're still children. Yes. Come 
Oh, we're children of God. Yeah. God, not the best word. <laughs> yeah. Not the divine that surrounds us. God loves us. It's okay. I always think of uh, <laughs> the comedian, what he used to say. You're going to go to damnation. You're going to go. If you don't do, you're going to be evil. <laughs> but he loves you. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a Southern Baptist preacher. <laughs> you're going to go to hell. They're all the same. They're not real. God, these people are not real. They just want your money. I wrote a song about it. We're going to release it on the next uh, chapter two. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so this is just chapter one that we're on. Yeah. All goes well. There's a chapter two. We've done a lot of songs for it. So, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive and experience the, the, the slow evolvement of the 2020. I always said on tour last year, I said, 2020 is just going to be like the 60s. <laughs> and it is. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are very similar. Yeah. Except for the free love. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, but, you know, we're going through a great time. That's all I can say. I love mm. the spin that you put on it, that it's a great time, because most people here in America and around the world, I imagine, too, are just going, when is this going to end? This is just so, you know, but they're not listening to and not receiving the message that, you know, it's time to take it slow and, and appreciate True. what we have. Look, Gratitude. Look inward. Yeah. True. And look at Mother Nature, as you said. Every, everything, everything is here. Church is here. Church. It's in the heart. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looks kind of cool. It's so big and frightening. Gothic. No, don't need that church thing stuff. I love the fact that maybe a decade ago you decided to become an American citizen. Yeah, I was very blessed to meet my wife. Uh, again, Linda Livingston, she introduced me to my wife. I'd been meditating before I met her. I'd seen her in my meditations, keep jumping up and down, this beautiful girl, waving. Yeah. Then she walked in my house in Hollywood. I was working on an album about Carlos Castaneda. Mm. And she walked in and I thought, oh my gosh, she's here. I love you. Are you Let's ready? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. How are you? Let's get married. I love you. Nice to see you. I couldn't say that, but that's what was going through my mind. And she saved me. She saved my life on many different levels. I'm so blessed. You had a couple of health issues maybe a decade ago also, and yeah. uh, you seem to have recovered very well, but a lot of... Um, Respiratory? Yeah. Was it asthma or... Yeah, asthmatic. Okay. I, that's why I can't, I can't really go out and... Uh, yeah. That's the way it is. But otherwise, I feel very, very healthy. Even with the broken foot. It'll be better. I, I've, got, I've got the last x-ray this Saturday, and ja Jane can't wait for me to drive. <laughs> <laughs> Take out the rubbish. Yeah, yeah. Get back <laughs> and to bring work. Bring in the firewood. Come <laughs> on. We got a cluck. No, it's warm here. No, no. no. <laughs> but thank you very much. It's been lovely talking to you. And it's very rare that I get the chance to talk like this. So we have what we call it's our end of show questions or our, our bonus round questions. Oh, good. So uh, we're going to just throw a bunch of questions at you real quick. And you may have already answered this, but uh, what was your first concert you went to? I was in a stroller and my mom in this little sort of in my in my Accrington where I lived, there was a, a school hall and I remember being moved in on the stroller and my mom was serving hot pies and fruit pies and things. And my dad was on the stage and I remember seeing him and he was standing there he had a kilt and he had a Hitler mustache. This is probably nineteen forty five. And he was telling jokes and Playing the harmonica. That huh. was my first concert. Wow. Who would you want to meet that you've never met? Oh, boy. Uh, so many people I'd like to meet, of course. Um, I think Stevie Wonder, like most people, like mm. most musicians. Mm. You want to, you know, you just, hi, Stevie. Yeah, just such incredible music that he's done as well. Very, yeah. Ugh. Uh, if you were making a documentary film, what rock subject would it be on? Gosh, you got me there. Um, I don't know. Okay. If you're making a documentary, I should know. I should know what I would want to The first do. thing that comes to my mind is something about spirituality of music, something like that, that you'd be excellent to tell that story. No, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> no. Another question. Okay. Uh, what band do you regret never seeing live? 
Oh, it's so so bizarre because I I remember in my first band, the Warriors, we we would go and open up for a multitude of bands, and one time we we went there for Saturday night concerts, and we opened up, and then Bill Haley was on, and Little Richard was on, wow, and Gene Vincent was on, and Eddie Cochran, and wow. I, the first song I ever sung was Eddie Cochran's song called uh, Something Else. Uh, what is the coolest piece of tour memorabilia you have? Gosh. Um, well, I've got an electronic plug-in. It's not, it's not a tour thing, no. Well, that's okay. No. Well, I've got... We, we don't really have rules. You can make this up. No. No. I remember going to... Um, talking about Hopi people. I, I got very... On my first time in Los Angeles to stay and work, <clears throat> I was doing an album called Big Generator. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, yes, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I was flying in and I read in Time magazine about the Hopi grandmothers are not going to move from the sacred big mountain, the four directions where the mountain is. And they're not going to move. They're being hassled by the Air Force flying over them very fast. And the young Indians being paid off to go and live in New Mexico. But they won't move these grandmothers from because the, the American whoever they wanted to strip mine this place mm. and it's their most sacred place you know so they never move so I read that and I got to Los Angeles and started thinking about Native American culture and reading more about what I don't know about them etc I was working in this studio with a friend of mine who, who could get me midnight till six for free and I could go in and mess around and make silly music mm. he called me up and said hey there's an event in East uh, L.A., it's at the school, and it's uh, for the Hopi grandmothers who are coming down wow. to sell some of their wares, you know. So it's an, an incredible time to go and meet and see what's going on. I said, okay, let's go. And there was uh, about maybe four or 500 people, all Native Americans, you know, and Chicanos and some Mexican people and a band playing on stage and I was mesmerized because I'd look around, I'd see these uh, very strong looking natives with the neck ornaments here, there. And I'd see them, I'd say, yeah, they're the, they're the elders. Yeah, I'm not going to speak to them, I don't know. And then this beautiful girl walks past in full regalia of, of the Native American wear their beautiful clothes, you know. So I'm following her and she went to this guy who was in the middle of all these other people. And he's a, she's a big guy with a Raids down here. Just his energy. I said, it's the chief. It must be the chief. So I turned around and another guy, a white guy, tall, thin white guy with a neck ornament around his neck and uh, beads and things, came walking towards me. He said, John, you've arrived. I said, yeah, who are you? He says, I'm Moon Otter. And he looked at me. He said, topographic oceans. <laughs> and I said, okay, you've arrived. I said, yeah. Well, why are you here? I said, well, I've read about the Hopi grandmothers and I, I believe in their stand, you know, for justice and things. And he said, what, what would you like to do? I said, you see that guy there? He said, oh, that's Long Walker. I said, Who, who's that? He said, well, he walked in 1967. He walked the length of America huh. to tell the government they were doing wrong. And he's called Long Walker. I said, I'd love to meet him. So it's just the way things happen in life, you know? Yeah. Eventually, I met him, and through his beautiful wife, Jessie, who wouldn't look at me, what do you want? And his <laughs> wife came over, what do you want? He wouldn't look at me. I said, I'd like to meet uh, Long Walker. Why? Well, I'd like to learn, actually. I'd just like to hear what he has to say about things and just learn. Okay, next Tuesday. So every other Tuesday, me and my friend Gary would go to East L.A. and sit and listen to Long Walker. Hmm. We eventually went to Chihuahua with him and some elders to a spring festival there up in the Copper Canyon. And I was in search of Carlos Castaneda at that time because he, he was supposed to be around that area. It's amazing how life takes you on this journey. You know? So I was making uh, that album, Toltec, when uh, my future wife came into the house. And <laughs> there was a lot of people around. My two oldest kids were here. They were hanging out with their friends and had about four or five musicians, an engineer and so I played some music, and then I just fell in love. It was a fantastic moment. Mm. So happy for you. Yeah, yeah. You bring such joy, such happiness, um, <laughs> and again, 
Thank you for this album. I can't wait to see it live. Thank I, you. Yes. I know that you did some stuff at the Rose Theater last uh, last yeah. tour. So, yeah. uh, you know, once this is over, are you going to be touring again? Yeah, we we're going to go out in October, but that's, that's all up the, the. Yeah. Can't do it because, uh, you know, asthmatic and, you know. Yeah. I, I don't want to get in a plane. I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah. And so I have a lot of work to do by the end of the year anyway. And uh, so I'll get that work done. And then I talked about maybe next spring we can go out with 1000 Hands Band. They're fantastic people and uh, they're a blessing to work with. And when I rehearsed with them, it was fantastic because they were very malleable. Mm. And they, they mm. would listen and I could come up with ideas to even evolve yes music a little bit. Doing the new music was fantastic, a lot of fun. You know, it's never that easy. You know, in this life, it's never that, that easy to do a tour. And, but everything went okay. There were some ups and downs and swings and roundabouts. We're just doing some videos now, so we're in touch with each other. Yeah. So hopefully next spring we can go out and perform. I would love to perform as m- many around the world as possible. It's That's it's that like. kind of music that deserves to be yeah. heard around the world. Yeah. 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 Love that. I just hope it doesn't take 30 years. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, John, thank you so much thank for all the years yes. you've given us from the first album to now. You've, thank you. You've given so much to the world, and uh, we really look forward to getting out of this COVID thing and seeing you on tour, and I can't wait to see it because yeah. it's going to be an amazing show. And there are live videos that are on YouTube, and we'll put them also on our website um, of, of Those videos some of the are new great music. Too. Some of the, like, uh, where does music come from? The yeah. video on that, I yeah. love that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so just all great stuff to you. Thank you so much for being this enlightened spirit and spending this thank time you. with us. Same. And we are, we are the same. That's why we're here. Yeah. And thank you so much for this album because I literally, again, it is, I just, it, I find such comfort in it during this thank pandemic. You. Yeah. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Peace. Peace. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, John. Bye. I love him. Ramallah. I love him, I love him, I love him. Sing some more. Now, nah, because I, I haven't. No, we sing. won't have to pay. If you sing and you sing poorly, we don't have to pay the rights, I believe. <laughs> but what if I sing and I sing really good? If well, I bring her that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what do you No, try so it. Mean, try it. Try mean. it. Sing. No, I, I haven't worn no, up actually, the vocal cords. Actually, we've heard you sing before on some other episodes, and you actually have a nice voice, Rita. Well, when I can, you know. Maybe you can join John for yeah. Rama Lama yeah. on tour when he goes out. And, you know, he comes to L.A. and he'll let you sing that one All song right. with you. You can be backup singer. Excellent. You want to do that? I'm on. Okay. I did it. Do it. I did it. I can do that. Keep going. Part of the song. Keep I going. did it. I'm not getting it right. I can't sing that high. I did it. I did it. Hey, anyway, okay. we don't want to lose it. We're going to suck things. it up. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, for John Anderson, who Zoomed with us all the way from San Luis Obispo for this uh, great interview. Big special thanks to Melissa Dragic Cordero and Ryan Romanesco for coordinating the interview. Special thanks to Michael Jensen of Jensen Communications. Thank you all. Appreciate it. John's website is johnanderson.com, Instagram, John Anderson Music, and Facebook, The John Anderson. For every... Okay, go ahead. Reese. There you go. All right. Every episode, we create show notes on our guests and about the subjects they talk about. If you go on the one for John, you're going to see brand new videos and other links to things that he talked about. You can also order the special limited edition colored vinyl of the new 1000 Hands album. Go check all that out, and you can find it under the show notes under each show title on our website. I hope you enjoy the album as much as I did. I just I love it. It's like a great meditation. In this pandemic time when we all need something special. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> something peaceful, right? <laughs> um, um. All right. Well, we ask for your help. If you listen via iTunes, please write a quick review and rate and subscribe the podcast, y'all. On Facebook, please follow, like, and share us with your rock buddies and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Tweet, 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 tweet. Keep rocking. Thanks for listening again, as always. Namaste, bitches. Bye.